So I'm coming to you folks from rural Ontario, which means my internet is okay. Um, what, I, what I know is it may, my time sound like I'm slurring because it slows down. And, uh, and then other times it uh, might speed up to catch up to where it's supposed to be. So anyways, I'm, I'm trying to speak at a regular cadence. Hopefully the internet cooperates. If I get a note that it's weak, I'll turn off my video for a couple of minutes and then it catches up and then well, we can, uh, I'll turn my video back on. I do have some slides to share. So some pictures and some notes here. Um, Rob and Chris are going to be um, filming this, which means you can kind of go back and pick out some of the details if you need to. So, so that's useful. Uh, but you might actually have value of a piece of paper and a pencil beside you just to jot down the odd name of a place um, or, or um, going to talk about flies and some other stuff along those lines too. So let, let's get started. Um, let me uh, bring my screen up here. I'm going to share screen. All right. Let's see this shortly. Okay. Algonquin Park Brook Trout. So welcome, folks. My name's Jeff Jackson, and I am the owner and operator of Algonquin Fly Fishing, where we're in the Ottawa Valley, east side of Algonquin Park. And all summer long, we run guided fly fishing trips. In the spring, it's Algonquin Park Brook Trout. And in the heart of summer, it's drift boat fly fishing for bass. Great fun. So um, um, what we're gonna do tonight, I'm gonna tell you the brook trout story for Algonquin Park. What's going on with that? Happy to entertain your questions, put them in the chat box, right? So drop them in the chat and I'll hit them as we go. If I'm gonna get there, I'm gonna ignore your question, but if it, I'm, I'll answer it eventually. If it's relevant, I'll answer it on the spot. And that's that's easy to make that work. Um, so, so as I said, I'm coming to you from the Ottawa Valley, which is the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin First Nation, after which our region is named and Algonquin Park is named. And my winter employer, I, I'm a college professor in winter at Algonquin College in an adventure tourism program and summer on guiding fly fishing trips. So let's begin. Um, uh, let's see, there's my, there's my pitch for what I'm doing, right? With Algonquin Fly Fishing, we'd be happy to, uh, happy to set you up for spring or summer trips, so check that out. Map of Ontario. So I'm going to make an assumption that many of you folks are in southern Ontario, although I do see a couple names of folks I recognize from the um, mid-regions of the province, and I recognize a couple of my clients on the line here, so welcome, folks. You see Algonquin Park. And you see my blue dot beside where I, where I am. The relevant part of this story is that the Canadian Shield, about the kind of the border between the north and south part of the province, is right on the southern end of the province, right on the southern end of the park. So the park is fundamentally in a different geography and geology and a different habitat, which is why brook trout are there and why they're not south of there. And I'm going to explain that story a little bit as well as the bigger, bigger story around fishing these things. So go just about anywhere in the Northern Hemisphere and say Algonquin Park, and this image will come in people's minds of a red canoe with a pine tree and a big blue lake. It's an iconic destination. Germans and Australians, Austrians love it. They all want to see Algonquin Park when they come to Canada. Interesting, well, you know, they drive across Highway 60 and say, that's it. That's not very exciting um, because they don't get to see the water that's in the background. Right? They don't get to see the wilderness, the backcountry, which is what we're going to be talking about. Not only that, it's famous for brook trout, historically famous. There's a whole hour and a half here of history, what I'm not going to do, but ecologically and habitat wise, it's a, it's a, a unique spot for brook trout. So that's a picture of one of my clients from just last year, um, a fairly novice fly fisher angler who caught a couple of decent fish, right? And that, that makes a good day. So you'll notice most of the photos are of me because I don't get photo releases from my clients typically and I don't ask for them, that, that's, that's fine. So here's the park. 
the park's geography is greater from a surface area, from an acreage standpoint, bigger than Prince Edward Island. Right? So, so it's a pretty substantial chunk of geography. It is wilderness. However, it is a working forest. There's logging. There's a couple seasonal cottages. There's kids camps. There's some, some action going on there beyond just the borders of a park. But importantly, it is a watershed for six major rivers. And the waters spill off this, this, this ridge, this high ground. It's the highest point in Southern Ontario. And the Bonnichere, Madawaska, Petawawa go east, the Oxtung South River go west to, to Georgian Bay. So it's truly, it's a watershed. And we're going to be fishing these lakes and streams at the headwaters of all of these rivers. That's why the park is a park, is because it is protecting the headwaters of all of these major river systems that are, that are a, a, a fundamental piece of, of the, the, the waterways in Ontario. Historically, these rivers were important for travel. That predated the railroad, well predated roads, whenever river travel was the primary means and whenever river travel was how logs were carried to market. That's whenever the, the, the park was set aside. So it's got a rich fishing history. 1896, the park was created and to, as, a, as a, a, a way to preserve these headwaters. And immediately the park management tagged themselves to fishing as a means of making this park viable. People needed to use it in order to make it pay for itself. So fishing was sold from day one and, and it's, been a, it's been a famous fishing destination early in its life was a much more famous one. And, it, and I would argue today it's not as famous as it used to be. What else we got going on? The history, the culture of Algonquin Park is this big stringer full of fish that people are gonna eat, right? Like that's, that's where the park came from. The park is still, uh, there's no catch and release mandate. There is some regulations, there's limits, but Certainly, it's built around this aura of come and catch a lot of fish. Um, lake trout and brook trout are the, the core species. The fascinating part of this history, though, was in these early days, there were these four-star hotels in the middle of the wilderness on the railroad lines. And people would come from Buffalo, from Pittsburgh and New York, stay for a month at these at these hotels where there's there's chefs and music and you were tuxedo to dinner at night and in the day you would hook up with a guy and you'd go fishing that's that's what the park was about for 50 years these these hotels were phased out in the 1950s and the road came in and more or less replaced that and stopped it from being a hotel overnight destination to be more of a day trip weekend a less of a commitment to get here so there's that whole history. It's, it's, I could go on about that fascinating part of the story, but it sets the stage for what we're doing here. Recognize this guy, Canada's most famous fly fisher. Oh, it's Tom Thompson, right? Famous artist. And, and his most famous painting, The West Wind, was uh, painted on Grand Lake in the northeast part of Algonquin Park. Um, he was well known as a fishing guide and worked as a park ranger. And in fact, his his most famous photo of him is him tying a, a spoon and a treble hook onto his fly fishing line. But in those days, he didn't call fly fishing. It was just fishing, right? That, that's what they did. And they'd fish spoons and they'd fish worms and they'd fish flies. They would do whatever it took to, to catch fish. They weren't as divided as we might be today. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of those blurry lines for our techniques we'll, we'll get to here eventually. So, um, the, the park itself, the, the shape of the park, the geology of the park has everything to do with the last ice age. So, so what we have here is that as the ice age receded, a major river flowed from west to east, basically drained Lake Superior, sorry, drained Lake Huron and Georgian Bay through Algonquin Park. So how would that happen? The ice sheet compresses the earth because it was so thick. It was two kilometers thick in this region, in the Algonquin region. So very heavy, crushed the earth and sank it. 
as the ice melted and retreated backwards, that was the low spot, the river came across it. So it created all these drainages. Slowly then, over, over 10,000 years, the land rebounded and pushed up. So igneous rock, sorry, granitic rock, granite, was scraped to the, to the, the um, bedrock, and that rose itself up, and that created the watersheds we have now. Because we were further north, and this cold water was flushing across here, it was prime trout habitat for longer because it didn't warm up. So while Southern Ontario was climbing out from the Ice Age, warming up, the water is warming up, chasing trout out of those waters, this water stayed cold. And whenever the land rose and created these lakes that are now isolated by waterfalls, by, by whatever the natural flow of the river is, it protected these brook trout habitat. And, and so we have native brook trout that are remnants from the, from the, the ice age, right? 10,000 year old um, species. So whenever we look at this, this, this park and this watersheds then, we're basically chasing the upper ends of these watersheds because that's where the, the fish were, were um, sustaining themselves longer. And that's why it's such a unique spot. So 1,500 lakes in Algonquin Park, 1,500 lakes, 260 of them are brook trout lakes, which raises the interesting question, why are they not all brook trout lakes? And I, I'm going to answer that in a little more detail later on down the road. It has to do with habitat, but it also has to do with modern competition. I'll kind of play that out a little bit. Lake trout. Algonquin Park was famous for its lake trout, and people came and still come for its lake trout. They were huge in the old days because they were undisturbed and could grow to great lengths. Now they're fished much heavier. But Algonquin Park also has great smallmouth bass fishing, and it has North America famous muskie fishing in the Petawawa River. So kayak anglers are all over the, the muskie fishing, whether it's by fly or traditional fishing. We also have fall fish, which some people would mistake them for creek chub, um, but they're not creek chub. It's, it's its own species, and they're, in fact, really fun to catch. And, 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 and I would say don't put up your nose at those. They take dry fly really well. Um, in the middle of summer when it's hot, they'll still come to the surface. They're quite a bit more aggressive, but you really only find them in the summer and fall, hence Fall fish. You don't have them in southern Ontario. You, you have creek chub instead, and this is because they, of the habitat that we, that we have here in the park. So Precambrian rock, meaning old, right? The old bedrock of the earth, some cases two and a half billion year old rock is exposed. It's very acidic. So, so as rain erodes that rock, the metallic, the, the, the uh, metals in it fill up the rivers and basically creates a pretty acidic environment to the point where it's marginal pH for brook trout. So yes, famous for brook trout, sure, but it's actually chemically not all that healthy. So our Algonquin Park lakes are around 4.8 on the, the, the pH scale and brook trout prefers six and a half to eight. So what does that mean? it means the density of fish is relatively low. So in any one acre of lake or any one strip of river, the density of fish is low. However, there is a lot of habitat all in one place. So that's the trade-off. You need to end up traveling more, go to different areas so that you can get access to more of these, these fish. Um, instead of focusing on one section of river because it's, the density is not there. So pH is a, is a story. It's improved since acid rain has gotten under control. It used to be worse. Um, pH was lower and it's slowly coming up. So I'll talk about, I'll talk about um, stocking here. Yes, there's splake. We have seen some folks in the chat box asking about splake. Um, I'm gonna show you a map about that in a second. So, there's this challenge in the north on all of our lakes. And it goes like this. 
in summer, the, the, so the lakes are the, are the source of water and these lakes feed the rivers, right? So, so that's, that's not news to people, especially in these headwaters. With warm summers, the top of the lake warms up and gets too warm for brook trout and way too warm for lake trout. So they go down. However, when you go down to where it's colder, there's no oxygen. So brook trout have this continual challenge between getting low enough to get their right temperature, which they would choose 10 to 15 degrees Celsius, but the top of an Algonquin Park Lake is gonna get over 20 in, in summer. So they go down and it's usually around 15 feet of depth is about where they hang out in summer. In spring when the lakes are cold, they're all through the water column and they're they're on the surface. And that's what I'm going to tell you. You're gonna you're gonna fish, you're going to fly fish for brook trout in May. That's what I'm gonna tell you because that's whenever the top of this the lake is the same temperature as the bottom and the fish are on the surface because that's where the bugs and the minnows are. That's where their food is. As it warms up and we get into mid-June, they leave the rivers, sorry, they, they, they leave the streams head into the lakes to go down and find cold water because even the streams warm up and get too warm for them. Are lake trout native too? Absolutely. Yeah, lake trout are native. It's so we have native genetic native species and we have brook trout genetic native species. So lakes, this well known that brook trout are not a trout, they're a char and that's why their flesh is so red compared to rainbow and brown trout which are not even their cousins, right? It's, it's a different species. Rainbow trout and brown trout are cousins. Brook trout and char are cousins, Arctic char. But look at this one. So this fish, uh, Petawala watershed, this fish, ox tongue watershed. See how much silver that is? It's almost got like a rainbow silver in the background of it. Uh, this fish, um, northern watershed, a map with the fall, or maybe the upper part of the Petawa, I don't remember, somewhere, somewhere in the North Gate. Three very different looking fish because they all evolved over 10,000 years in their own lakes and they don't talk to each other. So these watersheds don't connect. The Madawaska watershed drains out, the Petawawa drains out. They don't see each other between those watersheds. So, and in fact, they live in a lake and they live multiple generations in a lake. They don't go anywhere. So that allows them to be, to have local variation and local adaptation to the lakes that they are living in and the streams that feed those. So that's the, the unit of analysis here. That's the, the habitat we're looking at is a lake that hosts the adults and the streams where they're going to raise and, and, and um, the, the, fingerlings are going to go to retreat and grow their first couple of years. So local adaptation. So there's been stocking, talking about native species, yes, um, but there was through the, so think about the era. In the 1890s, everything in North America was getting stocked. That's when brown trout arrived. That's whenever rainbow trout were brought east. And that's whenever fish were brought in and stocking the different hotel lakes. So here's a map, 1899, the railroad line is the black line across the top and the black line across the middle. So those are the railroads and the yellow was the hotels and they immediately started stocking the lakes where the hotels were. Because the park was selling fishing and the era was all about stocking. They didn't understand what was going on ecologically. There, there's a recognizing what, what that, that, that that's not necessarily the case any longer. Um, there, was, there was pretty unadulterated stocking going on. Are these three brook trout species, are they subspecies? No, they're not subspecies. They're all, they're all the same species of brook trout. Their color's different because their water's different and their food's a little bit different. Right, that's really what it comes down to. There's not, nothing genetically different about them other than how they need to dress themselves up for cover. This, uh, this is from 1899, the first stocking train. So if you can read that, it says Department of Game and Fisheries of Ontario. That's their stocking car. So that car of a train car, especially designed to move 
fingerlings, keep them cold, and they would put them in milk buckets, portage them into these lakes and dump them. Right? That, and that happened across North America. But you'll notice the stocking was along the railroad lines because they could easily dump fish into the, into the riverways where the, where the trains were already traveling. So if we move ahead to 1937, that's when the highway was built. So that changed the traffic patterns a little bit in the park, but you can see they're stocking a little more. Now, not only stocking brook trout, they're stocking bass. So most of the lakes along the highway have bass in them. And that was seen at the time as being a desirable game fish because bass were only native to the northeast part of the park, um, not otherwise not very common in this region. The Petawawa watershed had its own native bass, but nothing else in Algonquin Park had bass. There's lots of it now. Anywhere that it's road accessible, there's bass now. Um, that happened a long time ago. So here's an interesting, interesting image. Failed stocking or experimental stocking. Over the years, they've tried Atlantic salmon, they've tried Arctic grayling, they've tried brown trout, none of it stuck. This is, like I said, this is the era where they would, they just, they didn't understand that Atlantic salmon couldn't just live anywhere. And they're trying all over the place to just drop these fish in. None of them stuck. Um, and in fact, we're back to our original native species. Splake, which is a hybrid between lake trout and speckled trout. Brook trout and speckled trout are the same fish, for the record. Um, locals call them speckled trout, but it's a brook trout, right? That, that's what it is um, from a species standpoint. So now, today, 2016, there's hardly any stocking. They stock splake primarily along the, the highway lakes, the road accessible fishing. So people can go and plunk their worm, although they not allowed to use worms. There's no live bait allowed in the park, but they can go and plunk their spoons and uh, and go and hopefully pull out a splake. In some cases, they are still stocking speckled trout, but it is speckled trout that's native to the park. In the early days, they weren't fussy about that. All time stocking for brook trout covers a lot of the park, but if you can see the heart of the park. Not been stocked. So red, the red lakes are, have been stocked, um, but the heart of the park has never been stocked. So that's where you're going to find the native brook trout, and that's honestly where the brook trout fishing is its best. Is the further you get away from the roads and the major lakes. If it was easy, everybody would understand that, right? Everybody would would fish that. Um, you've got to get away from those road accessible lakes, get beyond those to find the good fishing. Yeah, Demetia makes a point. I don't understand why outfitters sell worms. Yep, because they can. It is it's it's illegal um, to fish with live bait, but uh, lots of kids go and plunk worms still. They I'm not sure if that gets enforced or what the deal is. I could go on about the the lack of fishery management in this one. Okay, before we get to the how to fish them, let's talk a little more about the the fish themselves. So the life cycle: brook trout spawn in the fall. So the fishing season closes, we're in zone 15. So when you look up the, the, part, the fishing regulations for this area, zone 15, brook trout closes September 29th across the whole zone, Algonquin Park or otherwise. So, so the whole zone closes September 29th and it opens up again on January 1st for ice fishing, stays open through the spring and into the fall. However, Algonquin Park's brook trout season does not open until the end of April. So you could fish a border lake or stream outside the park as soon as the ice breaks, but you actually can't fish in the park until the, the last Saturday of April. That's, that's the, the, the fishing season. Now, remember the 1,500 lakes in Algonquin Park, 260 contain brook trout because they have very specific spawning requirements. They spawn in lakes, not rivers. We're going to be fishing the rivers. I'm gonna suggest that. We're gonna be fishing the lakes, but the rivers are going to be attached to a lake and it's, it's, a, it's where the fish are traveling into and out of those rivers and lakes. So they need gravel and it needs to have a freshwater spring coming up underneath it. 
Recall that all these lakes get covered with ice in the winter. The oxygen level in a lake slowly degrades all winter long, right? Fish are moving around, they're alive and awake underneath the ice, using up the oxygen. There's no fresh oxygen being ins inserted. Many lakes almost become oxygen depleted. If it's a long winter, there can be fish kills because they run out of oxygen. They just suffocate in their own lake. That's why for spawning, they need to be on springs, bringing fresh water, oxygenated water, that's going to keep it, take care of the eggs. So there's 260 of those lakes, currently as we understand them in Algonquin Park, that we recognize have the, the ideal habitat. As soon as those, those eggs hatch in spring, they head for a stream. They leave the lake and go, go to streams. And some of them are tiny streams, like three feet wide, a meter wide. That'll have year old fingerlings. Their first year of their life will be in that stream for protection, sun protection, predator protection, and bait bugs. And then in their second year, they're gonna drop down to a, a bigger stream. Second year fish is an eight inch fish. First year fish, they'll grow to about six inches long. Second year, you'll get about an eight inch fish third year 10 inch fish and if you're getting a four five six year old fish those are the ones that might grow to 16 18 inches long to get an over 18 inch fish in algonquin park that's a pretty substantial trophy um, and it's probably going to be quite old and it's going to be living in a lake it's no longer going back to visit the rivers um, because there's not enough food in the rivers ph level the temperature the water gets low it's just there's not enough bug life they're going to be eating minnows in the lakes to get that big. So by the third year, they leave the streams, go to the lakes, they visit the streams, sure, but they're living in a lake and they're eating minnows now. And that's how they get big. They spawn in about their third year. They live about five years. It's a pretty short-lived fish compared to smallmouth bass or musky, musky potentially 30-year-olds, smallmouth bass making it to 10 and 12 years old. Um, a five-year-old brook trout is a pretty substantial one. The one in the photo you're looking at right here, that's likely a four, a four or five-year-old fish who spent its last two years of its life in a lake, probably at the mouth of a river, right? Where a river dumps into the lake, that's where the fish are hanging out. All right. Um, Hawk asked a question, Crow to Hogan, is that a brook trout area? Oh yeah, tough spot to get to. Harder it is to get to, the better the fishing is. It's that easy, right? And we're going to look at a map here in a little bit. But if it looks hard to get to, it's going to be good. If it's easy to get to, lots of people got there before you. That's, that's just the way it goes. All right. Fingerlings. This would be a second year fish. Probably this was caught in the spring of its, of its second year. So the beginning of its second year. Can you see the par marks on that fish? So they're kind of like the light vertical bands or the dark bands reaching down. Those par marks disappear by the end of their second year. So if you see par marks, you've got a young fish. And like I said, that could be a seven, a seven inch fish, which is fun to catch on a little rod. Um, but when the par marks are gone, they're a solid two year old. How old would a 25 inch brookie be in Algonquin Park? A 25 inch brook trout would be in that seven or eight inch. We don't really see them bigger than that. Not anymore. It is what it comes down to. You can find on YouTube, there's some people who are posting some spin casting. They're dragging, you know, they're fishing lakes with big spinners. And they're catching some big fish, but they're, they're not common, right? They're not common. What's common is the 12 inch, 14 inch, and in the spring you can get 16 and 18 inch fish. Okay, big fish need big water. So this is one of my favorite streams to take people to. I'm not gonna drop my names of all the places I go, but you'll, you'll kind of be able to assess where you're gonna go on your own. But you can see this is a, a small stream dumping down into a pool that's about knee deep or thigh deep. There's a limit here. Like a 10 inch fish is what you're gonna catch in this kind of a pool. That's, that's what the food load is going to support. So realistically, if there was a lake just downstream and out of sight, Bigger fish could come and visit these pools. But in this particular case, this is just a widening pool in the river and there's a limit to what you're gonna catch, right? So we need to be realistic. There's no 
There's no 15 inch lunker just kind of like hanging in there waiting for something to come by. There's just not enough food in the streams and they get too warm in the summer. They've got to retreat to the lakes where it's colder and where there's more food. This lake will get over, this stream, excuse me, this stream will get over 20 degrees Celsius in the summer and it will get warm. Um, that's why you fish in the spring and the fall because the fish take off in the middle of summer, they go in and find the cold water pools and they hide. Okay, there's, a, there's a, the context. And now we're gonna talk about the fishing, right? The, the fishing itself. Um, so when, when are you gonna fish? Where are you gonna go? And how do we go about it? The, the tactics part of the story. So let's see, two important images for you. We are lucky that we're dealing with a park because it's well-researched. And in fact, what we know in North America about brook trout and lake trout is all research that came out of Algonquin Park. If you don't do this already, go to Google Scholar and type brook trout and you go get, you'll get research on habitat and food and reproduction. And you can learn the scientific end, sure, but you can skim it to kind of pick, pick out what, the, what, what uh, we know about these fish so far. We also have a place that's very well tracked from a, from a, a habitat standpoint and from a climate standpoint. Image on the left, ice out. So if you Google ice out Algonquin Park, you can get this data and you can get real time updates for what's happening with the ice in the spring. And I added the two newest or three newest dates here. So this, um, this graph was accurate to 2019 and I looked up the three newest dates, right? For 19, 20, 21. What does this tell you? Ice out is slowly getting earlier. So there are years across the bottom, the left-hand column, day of the year. So January 1st is day number one. So 90 days is the end of March. And then 120 days is the end of April, right? So, so that's, that's or sorry, end of, uh, 110 days uh, is the end of April. So what we have is ice out is slowly happening a little earlier every year. Right, that's that's good for us to know. That is Lake Opiango, which is a major lake. It's a big lake. It's not an absolute. So there might still be ice on Lake Opiango, and it could be out elsewhere. So in 2021, officially, they measured ice out on April 30th. Uh, I can tell you, we were in lockdown at that time, last year in April. Uh, I can tell you, I was fishing lakes on April 20th on the east side of the park. They were already open. Smaller lakes open up earlier. Uh, warmer lakes or lakes that have more current in them open up earlier. Opiongo Lake's the biggest lake in the park. It's, it's, a, it's a big lake. Um, so it's a little, it behaves a little bit differently. What this image also says on the right, average annual air temperature is slowly rising. So whether you look at Halliburton or whether you look at um, North Bay, or whether you look at Madawaska, Madawaska is closer to me, the east side of the park. You can see that it's slowly rising over the years. It's also interesting, four degrees is the average annual temperature. That's pretty low. <laughs> I was actually kind of surprised. Uh, it just shows the impact of a cold winter and how that drags down the average of a, of a warm summer. Um, but what we have going on here is warmer temperatures over the years, earlier, ice out, which sounds great for us for fishing, but the downside is brook trout need cold water and they're going to be net losers in the climate change story. So I think we're going to see, well, every generation would say the fishing is not as good as last generation, but we are seeing temperatures as the issue and not necessarily fishing as the issue around here. So um, to be continued, right, what this looks like, knowing though that spring is coming earlier with our average ISO temperatures. And you can track that. Like I said, you can, you can go to, uh, you can go to ISO at Algonquin and follow this. You just need to learn for your area if it ices out earlier or later. That's to do with elevation. High elevation is gonna be later. Okay, when to fish. You're gonna fish in May and by early June, it's gonna to be too warm. My, my cutoff used to be June 10th. I wouldn't book anybody for an Algonquin Park brook trip 
after June 10th. This year, I'm going to pull it up and say June 5th. Last year, June 10th, the water was 22 degrees and the air was 26. That is not brook trout fishing weather, right? They are hiding. They are not interested in, in, in coming to the surface. Uh, they're going down deep and they're going to the holes and they're, they're retreating to the lakes. So May is your month. The data from the park says that 50% of all takes of all flesh that's, that's consumed in the park happens in May. Right, so the park is open from, from May, to, May to September is the fishing season. 50% is taken in May. It's the fishing month. Uh, even though the camping season is not going underway yet, that's when people are going there to fish. There's a summer season, but that's lake fishing. You might have some fun fishing in the streams if you can find a cold stream. And you're going to be fishing the two-year-olds probably, or maybe some three-year-olds that are visiting. September. September's not as good as it used to be because of the warming summers. Last year, it never cooled off. We had 20 degree weather all through September. What is ideal, the old September have some cold nights starting in September 5th, September 6th, get some freezing nights, cool down the water, and those fish return from the lakes into the streams, and the fishing's great again in September. Not if it stays warm. So that's the last two years, September has not been very good. Um, it used to be great. I used to say it was my favorite time of year to fish and it's not anymore because it's, it's just getting too unreliable for weather. That's the when, right? That's the season. May, great. First week of June, yeah, it depends on the temperature. And if it warms up fast, it's gonna finish up a bit quicker. Okay, where to fish? outflows. So the number one fishing location in Algonquin Park is an outflow. What do I mean by that? An outflow is where we've got a little stream or a major river dumping into a lake. That's the ideal spot to be fishing. So you can see in this photo, there's a little stream, a little rapid dumping into the lake. Early in the, in the, the, the spring, ice out, water's cold, the fish will move anywhere because it's, they're not limited by temperature. However, it's oxygen poor. Fish go and school up at these inflows where, the, where these streams are dumping in because it's bringing in fresh oxygenated water. It's not that it's warm. It's not that it's bringing in a lot of food. But it's bringing in oxygen, and they, they're really starved for that. So the fish will be way more active where these streams dump in, I call them the outflows. It's the outflow of the stream. It's an inflow to the lake. So the outflows of these little streams are where the action is, is because that's where the water has oxygen and they can work, the fish can work. So on any one lake, you end up touring around in the spring and fishing the outflows, right? We end up fishing these things similarly to how we would fish a river. Yeah, we're casting on a lake, but we're in current. So that current's dumping in, there's going to be eddy lines down both sides where that current line is pushing in and losing its energy. And we can fish those eddy lines with a streamer, with a dry fly, just like we could do on any river. So you can take your river thinking and apply it to this, to this outflow environment. Here's a bit of a bigger place, right? So we've got, this is between two lakes. So it's a bigger river stream attaching two lakes. Algonquin Park is a big park of lakes, but these lakes are chained together with little streams, with medium-sized streams, with big rivers. So we're going to be fishing these connections between them. That's where the fun fishing is because the lake can support big fish. They can visit these rivers for food. They can visit these rivers for the oxygen. So same scenario here. If we've got a, major, a wider river, fairly gently moving in this case, with eddy lines on both sides, and the fish are hanging out here to catch the oxygen, and sure, to be feeding at the same time. But the fish don't sit like a brook trout or brown trout. They don't lock behind a rock and live their life there. These fish cruise. They're looking for food all the time because it's not plentiful. So they go traveling. So we don't see, we're typically not sight fishing. 
we don't look for one rock and expect a, a trout to be behind that to come up and sip our fly or we're going to drift over it. Maybe there's a fish there, but maybe it's cruised off to the other bay on the other side and is checking over there for minnows and crayfish. They're movers, right? And that makes them really finicky. Not the right word. Makes them really inconsistent where you could catch a fish here in the morning and in the afternoon they've moved off and gone somewhere else to a different outflow deeper water or to shallower water where it's warmer. They move around. They don't just hang in one eddy that's a reliable place. That's definitely frustrating. Even for me as a guide, I need to have five or six places to go fishing because two of them might be a bust. They're fine. Last week, we got a bunch of fish there. Today, we got nothing. There's nobody there because they've moved somewhere else. They're cruising. So outflows. Let me give you an example. Um, Welcome Lake. Welcome Lake is in the southern part of the park, south of Highway 60. And I'm going to tell you, it's, it's, I'm not giving away big secrets here. It's one of the few lakes that you can read in the regulations that it's not catch and release, but it has a very high slot limit. 18 inches or 20 inches, I forget which. You can't keep a brook trout under 20 inches, let's say. That's a big fish. So why would you go to Welcome Lake? Is because the, you're going to get older fish and you're going to get bigger fish. They're not being taken out of that lake. So outflows. If you can see, my, I'm going to bring up my little drawing pen here just in a second. My annotation. I got my drawing pen. All right. So if I'm going on, if I'm going to fish in Welcome Lake, here's where I'm going to fish is where this stream comes in right here where this stream comes in right here, and where this stream comes in right here, right? Those are the spots to be fishing. They're gonna be dumping in fresh, clean, oxygenated water. And you can see you could camp there. Welcome Lake, you can get there in probably a day's travel or a little less than a day. Set up a camp, spend the evening fishing the outflows, spend the next morning fishing the outflows and the edge of the lake, and then you can go home, right? Paddle your way home. Um, all of the fishing in Algonquin Park, you've got to work to get there. I'm going to show you one place in the whole park where you can drive to brook trout fishing. Everybody knows it's there, so it's not great fishing, but it's the only place that you can just park your car and fish. Everywhere else, you're going to need a canoe or you're going to need to walk and go and find the fish. Outflows. If I was going to go on Harry's Lake, I would fish right here, right where that main lake is dumping in. That's the most promising part. So these, these orange fish, that's a brook trout indicator. So the, all of these lakes have brook trout in them. So if there's brook trout in this lake and there's brook trout in this lake, there's brook trout in that river. It's that easy, right? Like that's, that's not magic, but that's how we put this together. Likewise, in Harry's Lake, I'm going to fish this outflow and I'm going to fish this outflow. That dashed line is a seasonal spring and it, it dries up in summer. And likewise for Rents Lake, right? So Rents Lake has some inflows and I'm gonna fish these inflows and I'm gonna, I, I'm gonna also at the same time fish the outflow. They'll also gang up at that outflow because it's a drain, right? It's a funnel and there's food that's collecting there too. So outflows, right? There, there's a story what, what that's about. Let me get rid of my drawings here. Okay, so that's, that's the first place you're gonna fish. Let me, let me play this out a little more. So this welcome lake, Drains into, drains into Penn Lake. Actually, I'll show you here. What map is this? I'm going to tell you more about maps a little bit later on. This is the Algonquin Park map, but uh, there's problems with that too. So you can see this long stream. That long stream is going to be full of fish, right? So yeah, that's a long portage. 2,000 meter portage. You're going to walk two kilometers with your canoe on your back. That's why Welcome Lake's good fishing is because not many people are willing to walk two kilometers with their canoe and their campsite on their back. Um, however, that stream, if there's brook trout in the lake above it, there's brook trout in the lake below it, that stream's going to have brook trout in it. All right, so um, let's look at, so I'm going to show you Google Earth of this image way down here where, where Welcome Creek or Gallup River it's called, but everybody calls it Welcome Creek, where it hits Penn Lake. Looks like this. So you can see where the current's coming in, yeah? So current's pushing in. You can see it's bringing silt with it. 
as a, as a satellite phone, you can see what that looks like. It's going to have those eddy lines where the current's pushing out. So that's where the that's where the action is, right? It's bringing in oxygenated water. It's bringing in food into this lake. In May, it's probably a little bit warmer, so the fish are going to be hanging out there and they'd be happy about that. Whenever the lake is at four degrees Celsius, they're happy to go and find some eight degrees water. That's their temperature, right? Ten to fifteen is what they like. Carry a thermometer. 10 to 15 is what they like. If it's colder, you've got to go looking for oxygen. If it's warmer, you've got to go deep, right? That's, that's how that goes. So note in this image, though, there's also a drop-off. So where's the fish going to be? They're going to be right in the corners of these drop-offs where that current's pushing in. Remember, it's spring. It's cold. They're not super active, so they're not going to fight current. They're going to hang out in the calm water, right? That's going to be their choice. Almost always you're going to catch brook trout in the calm water right beside the current. They're not usually hanging out in the current. That's not a good use of their calories. So that, that's where you'd fish this. As you approach this area in your canoe, you see that there's an outflow. You cast against this backdrop, against this, this, um, this drop off, just to make sure that anybody's on the surface. And then you come up, pull your canoe on shore, you get out in your waders and you cast back into this drop off, cast into the lake and strip back in the current there's a good chance of finding something there. Likewise, we'll see some fish kind of where the current slows, right? So we got them right on the eddy lines and kind of like a little bit further out where the current dies. And you can see that when you're standing there, you'll see current going by you and you'll see where it dies, depends on the, the, the volume of water, but potentially 60 feet out the current dies and that's where there's gonna be fish hanging out there. It's a good use of their calories to be hanging out right where the water stops, right? Brings out food, food stops right there. All right, same with this scenario you saw before. Those fish are gonna be hanging out down in the calm water. They're not, they're not rainbow trout with their face in the current waiting for food because the food's not coming very often. Instead, they're in calm water and the slower water. Likewise, a scenario we looked at already, right? Same thing. You might find a couple fish up in that calmer water, but more likely you're gonna catch the fish down a little bit lower. So your first cast should be in close just to clean that up and see if there's anybody there. Um, but otherwise, you're going to probably be fishing out a little bit deeper. All right. Outflows is my number one spot, to, my number one favorite spot to fish in May. And, and I basically plan a trip onto how many outflows I can hit. Now, those outflows represent streams, right? There's streams or rivers flowing into these lakes. So they're usually not great early May because they're flooded. They're in their fresh air, meaning that's when the, the snow melt is pumping through. Not great fishing. Too it's too fast. The fish are in there, but the water's high, the water's cold. There's not a lot of food. Their fish are a little lazy. They're just kind of waiting for things to warm up and become a little more active for them. So mid-May, once the kind of snow peak is over and the water's falling, that, that area until early June is the time to be in the streams. My favorite time to fish in Algonquin Park, right? Is that mid-May, early June, when the streams look like this. So that photo, those rocks, you can see there's a high water line there, right? That, that river is two or three feet higher in spring. And then when the melts down, it drops. And that's whenever the fishing becomes good. So uh, temperatures again below eight degrees Celsius, it's pretty late. The fish are pretty lazy. Um, and in that fact, you're better to go and fish at the lakes because the lakes warm up quicker. It's calm water. Um, if the water gets to 20 degrees Celsius, there's not going to be a lot in the streams. There, you might catch some aggressive two-year-olds. Great. Um, fun enough. But, but they're going to be heading out for deeper water, colder water. Um, not very productive euro-nymphing? No not very productive euro-nymphing. Um, here's the thing with euro-nymphing. The rivers are not consistent. You're going to see some more pictures of rivers here. It's narrow shoots of fast water with calm water beside them. We don't have the nice wide long drift. I'm imagining many of you would know the Grand River or the Credit River. Like lots of nice river wide current. We don't have those. You've got these little narrow shoots of current pushing into a pool and then it dies. So it doesn't have that nice drift. Um, second part, the bottom is very inconsistent for depth. So you can have a, a, a shallow rapid dump into an eight foot deep pool and then 
30 feet later go into a rafting. So really inconsistent. Euronymphing is not great. Um, it would typically we're going to be wet, we're going to use swinging wet flies or streamers and, and dry flies on top of that. I don't fish nymphs very often. Not unless I'm experimenting, really. I would prefer to prefer to either be wet swinging or um, stripping streamers. I'll tell you about that. Okay. Um, temperature, right? Temperature. But you know, you've got this window of time, and now it's a question of where's the best place given when you're there? Should you be in the lakes, the outflows, or can you go up in the streams given what's going on there? Okay. Fishing streams. You know how to fish streams, right? So here's a Here's an example of a river, waterfall, nice waterfall tumbling down into a pool, bringing perfectly oxygenated water, um, casting into this nice gentle current, and then just to the left out of sight is another rapid, right? So basically it's a mini pond in the midst of a rapid. That's where brook trout are hanging out, right? Because it's deep, it's colder, and there's a steady supply of oxygen, and they can find the food that they need there. That's a, that's a, pack raft that you see there, which is an inflatable one-person kayak. So we do that sometimes. That's not a standard trip that I run, but I've got access to pack rafts where we can, basically they're very light, right? You can portage them all over the place. It weighs 10 pounds. Um, so it certainly works. Uh, bigger river. Again, you can see a waterfall in the background. You see a theme here, right? Big waterfall comes and dumps around the corner and a fairly major river, right? So that that's, what, 15 meters wide, that's waist deep, faster, and, and gonna be fishing that a little differently. But that's a river, that's river fishing, right? So you got everything from the little streams, medium-sized pools, just some big pushing rivers, and we can find fish in all of those uh, as long as those temperatures are right in May. There's textbook Algonquin Park stream. So you can see that's not a real Euro-nymphing kind of place, right? So it's got a, a, a drop that trees created a ledge, oxygenates the water, and there's a fast current going down the right side. The left side's got a deeper pool. Um, that's standard. That will hold fish all year, right? So totally fishable all year, even when the water warms up. Why? Because it, the fish can be oxygenated all year. So warm water does not hold as much oxygen as cold water. So it's not the temperature that's the problem. It's the amount of oxygen in the water that's the problem. So if they can have ox source to, of oxygen, they can hang out in warmer water. So on this pool, it's pretty reliable spot. So, so you got the deep pool on the side and you've got the tailouts because the current's more gentle out there and the fish are willing to hang around there. We'll talk about the rod set up here in a, in a second, what the rod weights and what your lines are going to be. So standard, that's, that's, that's textbook right there, right? Deep pools, plunge pools. You can see why nymphing doesn't work great. It's a short pool. It's going really fast. Nymphs don't get down very well. You're better off dry fly or wet fly, some kind of version around that, which I'll talk about in a sec. All right, back to, back to, um, Let's see, this is Gallipo, this is Welcome Creek. River's going downstream, right? So it's got a series of rapids, which would have a portage trail around them. All the portage trails are marked for the record. They're on the map, but there's also a sign on the tree. They're very well maintained. So like they're maintained like a hiking trail. They'll be almost always clear of, of deadfall. If you're there early in the year, maybe not, but, but potentially. So what do we got? Pools, there's two pools in the middle of this rapid. They're going to be holding fish. They have access to a lake so they can get bigger. They can visit the river where they've got food being delivered to them and they've got oxygen. They can go back and forth to that lake. And of course, there's the outflow, right? So you're always going to be fishing the outflow of any of these lakes. If you're doing a canoe trip, you should always fish at the portages. So you canoe up to the portage. You should always fish at the top and the bottom of every one because there's a funnels for the food. Um, bears, don't see a lot of bears. Greg is asking that question. There are bears in Algonquin Park. There are also moose in Algonquin Park, but you don't see a lot of them. Um, I spend a lot of time there in the spring, medium amount of time in the summer, um, and I don't see a lot of bears. Only one every couple summers, not even one a year. All right, outflows, streams, and we've got lakes. 
So, so there'd be lots of fly fishing, lots of avid fly fishers don't really have much interest in lakes. And then there's some who are dedicated to it, but you can combine the two of them in Algonquin Park pretty seamlessly, especially in the spring. So, so what that looks like is, is cruising the lakes on your way to another outflow. You might as well be fishing on your way to get there. And, and the fish could, you could be intercepting a group that are fishing along the way. Peter, I see you have a question. You're welcome to unmute yourself, Peter, and ask your question. You got it there? Yep. Go ahead, Peter. No, I don't got you. Why don't you type your question in the uh, chat box, Peter? I can't hear you. All right, lakes. So, so what's going on with lakes? Fishing about eight feet deep in spring. So I'm talking about spring here now. And the water's cold, right? About eight feet deep, that's kind of about, the, about what you're looking for, right? Something along those lines. Um, that, that's, that's your goal. And that's probably about 30 feet offshore is how that, is how that works out. Um, I would suggest by canoe, although you can float too, that's fine. I'll talk a little more about boats in a second here. But the idea would be you cast to shore and you strip the, the fly back, right? Then as you're traveling along in your canoe, your float tube, you cast to shore and you strip the fly back. Because the fish are hanging out closer to shore, because the water's warmer close to shore, and that's where the minnows are, right? That's, that's what the story's all about. So they're chasing the food. Um, I'll talk about summer trolling a little bit later. If you're to come back in July or August for a canoe trip with your family, you can certainly fish for, for a brook trout, but they're gonna be in the lakes and you're gonna be trolling. And trolling's not fly fishing, trolling's trolling. Right? And I'm okay with that. It's not spin casting, it's not fly fishing, it's trolling. You don't even need fly. Some people, you could just hold a line and troll a spoon or fly behind you while you paddle along. Uh, that works fine, that, that's trolling. I, I'm not gonna spend much time on that. I'll bump into that in a little bit here on tactics. Okay, lakes. In the spring, you fish about 30 feet offshore, casting to shore and bringing it back while you're traveling along to the next outflow. So as you're kind of moving, you plan a route that gives you access to a couple streams, to a bunch of outflows, travels across one or two lakes. You're gonna have access to different places and different fishing and you have a good shot of catching something. All right. That's when, that's where. Let's talk a little bit about the tactics into the story, right? How, how we're gonna fish. So um, let's start with bugs. There's not a bug scene in Algonquin Park, right? It's not a, like, you don't need to worry about matching the hatch and having the right flies for the bugs. That's not really what it's about. They will eat just about anything. Remember the food, the food is pretty low. The, the food volume is pretty low. So they're not fussy. So put just about anything that looks like a mayfly in spring. Later on in, in end of May, June, dragonfly damselflies. Great. Mayflies are so good. Once it gets hot, caddisflies come around. And certainly in the summer and fall, caddisflies are more productive than mayflies. But you know what? You don't need to be too fussy about that. The medium size and bigger fish. So anything that's, that's 12 inches and longer is going to be eating minnows. So um, what fly does that remind you of on the right-hand side? The Mickey fin is the standard Algonquin Park fly. If I could carry one fly in Algonquin Park, it's a Mickey fin. For those of you who don't know the names, that's, it's red and it's yellow. Here's the very interesting part of, about Algonquin Park. Um, red belly dace, fine scale dace, they have a red belly in spawning season, which is May. All across Ontario, they turn red. In Algonquin Park, they turn yellow. How about that? So the fish are yellow in Algonquin, the food is yellow in Algonquin Park in May. That's, that's all you need to know. So if you're gonna be choosing flies, yellow is the color to choose and that's the standard Mickey fin. Let me pull one out here. Um, and, and I mean, this is a classic fly. It, this, this fly was developed by somebody in Quebec in, in uh, 1890s, I believe, right? So a little bit of red 
and yellow on a flash body. Standard Mickey Finn that's, I tie three dozen of these every winter because every client I have is fishing Mickey Finns, right? So, because that's what the food is, right? it's that easy. Long nose dace, we actually don't have black nose dace in, in Algonquin Park. The very southern part of the panhandle, there's some black nose dace, but that's a Southern Ontario minnow. We have long nose, looks just like them. Um, and they are more black and white. So you can always use the, the black nose days fly. That's just the black and white version of the Mickey Finn. But that's the fly, right? That's one fly you're going to carry. Um, now, now, I'll talk a little bit about noisy flies and quiet flies, but we're really looking for yellow, right? So, so there's a muddler head. This is a bunny muddler, a muddler head with a yellow body. Not because I'm trying to create a sculpin, which is what the muddler minnow was tied to recreate. I just want a big noisy head that pushes water and can be found. So lakes are deep, lakes are dark. I want to create some noise and this fly is pretty reliable in the bigger water of a lake. Yellow, right? So yellow. And that's because of the dace, um, the fine scale and the red belly. They turn yellow. Um, big fish though are also being black leeches. So black wooly bugger, yeah. Any leech imitation that's black and, and swimmy, great. Crayfish, brown wooly bugger, yeah, sure. Right, or any version of a crayfish, those are gonna work. Those big fish you see are definitely eating crayfish because that's got a lot of calories for the punch. So um, yeah, along the shoreline, you're welcome to do that. Um, and then summertime, just like anywhere else, beetles and ants, totally works. All right. So flies, um, what are you gonna carry for flies? You're gonna carry some streamers and you're gonna carry some wet flies, so some dry flies that can become wet flies. So Mickey Finn, great. Um, you could be carrying a, a, a muddler bunny or some version of that, something that's yellow and sweaty, right? That's what you're looking for. Um, are any of you, are any of you um, spin casters? Here's, here's the absolute, if you're a spin caster, fishing in Algonquin Park, or you're going to troll, you're going to bring a blue little Cleo, a spoon, right? A blue little Cleo spoon. So you can create a fly version of a blue little Cleo with, with blue jay feather, right? So if you have access to blue jay, you can create the same thing. It's basically a little Matuka streamer that's tied with blue jay. But it's got that same white and blue that exactly has got a blue little, a little Cleo. So ask the spin fisherman what works, and we're going to copy it, right? So that, that totally works. Um, that's the, that's the, the streamers. If you just have a, a muddler minnow and you have a, have a Mickey fin, you're going to be fine, right? And variations around those, they're totally fine. Um, what size for a little Clio? So for spin casters, am I allowed to answer that question in a fly fishing session? I'm not sure. Um, it's relative to the water. So if you're going to troll big lakes, you're going to use a big little Clio. And if you're going to be cast, uh, fishing the outflows or a smaller streams, you're going to be using a little one. I don't even know how they're sized. I know nothing about spin casting. Um, so flies. Let's go to the other end, the, the, um, the dry fly into the world. So here's what I recommend for dry flies. Just about anything that doesn't have a big hackle. So what do I mean by that? I mean um, I use a hair's ear emerger all the time. So basically a deer hair on top or a comparadon, uh, a de usual. These are all the same flies as far as I'm concerned. Um, they're all very similar, so super small here. But what are we looking at? We're looking at a body that'll float, but it's buggy, right? So kind of a deer hairish or, or um, uh, hair's ear kind of body with deer on top, right? To create somewhat of a wing, but not a hackle. Why not a hackle? Yeah, you can use a hackle, that's fine. But we're not looking for a tiptoe uh, cat skill style dry fly daintily floating on the surface. That's not the water we're fishing. It's fast, it pumps them through. So something that sits lower is definitely gonna work, right? So something that sits lower is gonna work. And that's why I always end up carrying some kind of either parachute atoms, um, or hair's ear merger, a usual, a comparadon, any of those that are going to sit pretty low, right? So they've got a little bit of a, of a 
a deer top to them, a bit of it, usually a deer tail, so they float pretty well, and a buggy body. How we fish them, yeah, clink hammer. Yeah, totally clink hammer works. Um, how we fish them is like this. You throw them upstream, dry fly, let it come down through the current, drift right on by you, go to the end, dangle and sink. And now it's a wet fly hanging out at the end of the pool and you let it hang there. And then you strip, strip, give it a move because you're at the bottom of the pool, nothing happens, pick it up, cast it upstream, dry fly, float down the current line, down the eddy line, go to the end of your line, let it sink and swing a wet fly. So you're fishing this dry fly to wet fly, right? So the casting itself is usually tight. You don't get a nice big back cast. You're usually standing right in the current, right? And you're trying to throw into the current and it comes right down, floats by you, and you let it dangle out the back door. One of the brook trout, you fish the same for brook trout today as we did 100 years ago. So, so this is the Hornberg, if you're familiar with the Hornberg. It's, not, it's an old classic fly. It was designed to be a dry fly that floats by you and then turns into a wet fly at the bottom. So look up the Hornberg. Um, totally, totally works, right? Totally works um, for that model of in a stream, cast upstream, float it, goes to the bottom, comes tight, sinks, and turns into a wet fly, strip, strip, nothing happens, cast it up again. My experience is um, five to one, you catch them on the wet end of the cast instead of the dry end of the cast. When you show up at a pool, your first two casts are your most productive for the dry fly. Otherwise, it's going to be the swinging wet fly. Your fly gets wetter and wetter and goes deeper and deeper, and that's perfectly fine because the fish can see it and it's going right by their face. Remember, they're not hanging out in one spot waiting for mayflies to go over their head. They're hanging out in colder water where it's safer. And if we swing something by them that's a little noisier underwater, they come and find it, they come and grab it. Just gonna check my, my chat box here to see any questions. Okay, flies, yes, I'm showing some flies. And hopefully though, you just catch those names and you go look those up, right? Go look those up um, rather than looking at mine. Um, Okay, spin fishing. Are we allowed to talk about spin fishing in a fly fishing session? Sure. Um, mousing, I don't cast mouse, but you certainly could troll mouse in, in a bigger lake for sure. Troll them along the shore at some of these outflows, you could swim them across. Um, so, names of flies, right? What do we have there? For dries, hair's ear, emerger, comparadon, um, usual. Those are all based on the haystack, which is a hundred year old fly. I use the haystack because it floats better. Hornberg is that dry to wet fly. And then you've got the, 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 the Mickey Finn, right? That's, that's the standard. Um, I'm not gonna say any I, wet flies, grab any of the classics, but I don't carry specific wet flies. I just sink my dry flies. Works fine. Uh, it's not a fly game. It's about finding them and it's about Putting, the, putting it where they can eat it, right? That's really the story. Um, changing flies is not the story. It's often about finding a new line to drift or it's getting it a bit deeper, something along those lines, getting into a different part of the pool. All right, the fly story will kind of keep coming along here. So this is, a, see the photo here. This is what our dry fly fishing looks like. It's in white water. It's not great dry fly fishing. And that's why we end up fishing them wet is we cast up into the top of that current drift down the eddy lines, the main heart of that flow is not going to hold a fish. It's just not a good place for them to spend their day. You're going to drift it down the eddy line, um, and then it's going to turn into drowned, and you're, you're going to hang it out the back and let it get wet, sink water ski there a little bit, right? It's like dangling on the end of your line. You can strip it back up to you. And like I said, five to one, it's, it's on that dangle in the strip, which is when they're coming up. So the faster the water, the wetter you're going to fish. If it's really fast water, they can't see it go by. It goes by too quick. It's better off in the water as a drowned wet fly. So being tumbled in the current, totally fine. Let it go swing down to the bottom of the line and then you pull it up. Slower current, if you get a nice deep slow outflow, great, you can put a nice dry fly in there because the fish will come right into the current to eat it. It's not too much work. Not fussy on flies. Um, 
but they are spooky. Not and so so this as in as in if you put a fly over their head ten times and they don't like it, they're not going to eat. Changing a fly is probably not going to change that story. They're spooky that way. So if you get two solid flashes on a fly and they don't take it, leave that fish alone and come back a half an hour later. Especially if it's in a if it's in a stream or an outflow, it'll it'll be hanging out there. Um, you know what I mean by a flash? You're watching your fly and you see the fish come up and do a big turn on it and it, there's a flash of silver, um, but no hit. They don't like your fly or they don't like the drift. Changing the fly is not going to change that story. You might get two of those from a fish and then it's going out to hang out. They're too spooky. They won't just, it's not like a brown trout that'll let a fly go over their head all day long and they just ignore it. They actually go hide, right? Because they're, they're spooky that way. Leave them alone and come back and come back 15 or, or 30 minutes later. Um, casting sucks. Uh, there's no shoreline. It's rocks and it's trees. So you're going to be roll casting. You're going to be standing in the middle of the current casting straight upstream or casting directly downstream with your dry flies, right? Not textbook fishing at all. But that's just all you really get to do because there's, there's, there's nowhere to go. So uh, the best places to cast probably don't have fish attached to them, right? You've got to find the place and then make a cast work. They're not fussy about that, right? It's, it's especially if you can keep that fly wherever they are, they'll, they'll come and grab them. So let's talk gear. Um, I put in my client's hands, I put a five weight rod and I bring a sinking leader that goes on and off that. In fact, I bring two rods, right? So everybody gets two rods. On the lakes, they're going to use a, fly, a rod that's already set up with a sinking leader. A 12, I use a 12 foot sinking leader, the longest ones you can find. Uh, in some cases, I actually use a dedicated sinking or sinking tip line, but you're looking for a floating line with a sinking tip to, to, to fish the lakes and even to fish those outflows. But I would, I would start with, um, you show up in an outflow, I'd start with dry flies on a floating line. That's the other rod, right? Five weights, fine. Four weights, fine. I, I suggest five because you can put that sinking tip on it and not have to change your rod. You may not, if you're going to do a portage canoeing trip, you don't want to bring two rods. You're going to bring one. Um, and then you, you put your sinking leader on and off it. So if you show up at an area where there's an outflow or you're in a stream, sinking line, sorry, floating line. So you're going to use a floating line for the streams and for the outflows. On the lakes, you're going to use it, put a sinking leader onto that thing, right? A 12 foot sinking leader and shorten your, your actual leader up to like three feet long then. Um, works perfectly fine, right? So you're basically going to fish that floating line with the sinking leader on the lake, take the, take the leader off, and now you've got a dry fly line. That's if you're going to use one, one rod, or you could potentially be carrying two rods preset. If you're going to go and you've got something set up and you're going to hike in and just fish streams, then there's some spaces on the, the upland bike, uplands hiking trail. You can hike in and just fish streams. Um, a three weight's fine. But a three weight's not going to work very good for the outflows because it doesn't really throw a Mickey fin very well. It doesn't flow, throw a muddler minnow very well. But a five weight will do that. So five weight's kind of the standard as far as that goes. Um, fast or slow sink, fast sink, fast as you got. Because that water's going fast and the pools are short, you don't get time to do a nice long dropping swing. You want it to go down, boom, right? And it can be loud and noisy. That's perfectly okay. In fact, noisy flies work just fine. How long are the rods? Um, not fussy. So, so I put nine foot rods in everybody's hand. I fish with a nine foot unless I'm going to dedicated stream fishing and then I'll use a short three weight. So I have a seven, my personal, I don't give clients this, but I have a seven and a half foot three weight that I like, but I only use for little stream fishing. Uh, that's not worth you buying one of those. Your five weight, nine foot will work. Um, you're going to be doing roll casting, and if you need to, if it's too long, you get down on your knees and do your roll casts right from down low. That can work. Um, 5X leader, yep, yep, 5X leader will do. If you're going to run that, that sinking tip, you're going to put a, a sinking leader, a 12-foot sinking leader on the end of your fly line. You can then shorten that down to just like straight mono. Use like 4X, 3X straight mono with a Mickey fin on it. That's perfectly fine. Um, they're not leader shy. That's not the story. 
um, it's getting it's getting the food to where they're going to be. Right? They don't get time to look at it. It's they've got to react, and and they, the pools are short, the water's fast, the the hits are fast. They're not big fish, so it's not like a smash, but it's exciting because they seem to come out of nowhere. They come at it fast. It's not a gentle little sip. It's a charge and a grab. Very fun. So that that's the gear story. Um, even the bigger fish, you know, if you, if you can see some of the photos here where, where potentially have 18 inch fish, that, that, that's great fun, but they're not gonna pull line off your reel. They're not even really gonna threaten your 5X very much. Um, you, you don't need to worry about backing in a lot of run. They're not gonna see a run out of that. You can pretty much hook them and strip them um, back to where you are, right? Bring them in. Gear, what else do you need to know about gear? Um, floating line. Sinking leader, 5X, yeah, not fussy. That's not the deal breaker, right? That, that's not the important part of the story here. Um, you, can go, you can go lighter, fine. You're going to catch lots of little fish, and you can go up to a six. Uh, I fish six myself quite a bit, especially if it's mostly going to be lakes and outflows. Six is good because I like swing streamers on a six. I'm not really anticipating I'm going to do as much dry fly fishing. Then I just stick with a six. That's fine. That'll work fine. Um, outflows. Outflows where the sinking tip comes into play, right? So you would either use a sinking tip line or put the sinking leader on your line. I want to talk a little bit about noisy flies versus clean flies. So a standard Mickey fin is very clean, right? So, so it, it's, I'm going to hold this up to the camera again. So it's very clean, right? It's got a little head that when it gets wet, that, that, that bucktail comes down and it, it's just flashy and small. That doesn't push a lot of water, and it's the water's dark, the water's deep. If a fish is six or eight feet down, and this is at two feet, it may not even recognize it as there. So, and that's where that that bunny muddler with the bigger head does a better job of pushing water, right? So that's why that head stays big. I don't trim them down nice and tight like you see in all the YouTube videos. I keep them big and bushy, so it pushes water. And then I I, I tie variations of the Mickey fins and just vari variations on how heavy they are, right? So that I can even use a floating line if I wanted to. Um, clouser. So there's a Mickey fin clouser, right? So if you're gonna use a floating line and not carry a sinking leader, then you're gonna have to use a fly to get down. So that works perfectly fine, right? So there's lead eyes, uh, dumbbell eyes on a, on a Mickey fin. You can put cone heads on them. You can wrap them in lead, whatever, wrap them in wire, whatever you need to do. Um, thinking about how can you get that fly at different levels of fishing, right? So there's the surface, great. But if you want to go deeper, how can you make that work? Flash flies. I've been experimenting with flashy yellow flies, and I've had no success. That classic Mickey Finn beats them. So putting that gold flash, you know, tinsel into a Mickey Finn. Um, no interest, right? So I would say, therefore, not bother. I've got a whole bunch of them that I never use. Um, my thought was, potentially on a, on on the bigger lakes or or casting on the lakes, is that the flash would be good to bring them in, but it hasn't proven out to be that way. Um, so flash flies, not really. Noisy flies, yeah. If you're in noisy flies are a good idea. If you're in smaller, narrow water, not as important because the fish are closer to where your fly is, right? Makes sense. Um, yeah, outflows. You're basically swinging when you're on outflow, right? You're in the current, let it go into the lake and you swing it around and then you strip it back up. Schooling, schooling's not really the right word, but the fish bunch up and travel together. And like I said, one outflow, well, actually I can tell you this spot right here, it's one of my favorites to go to. Um, I've occasionally show up there and nothing. No fish, right? There's no fish to be had. So put 30 casts in, all in the different areas. No fish to be had. Leave, come back four hours later and catch fish there. So were they there and just not eating? Maybe. Um, I'm thinking more along the line that, that they weren't there. They had moved, they had schooled up and gone somewhere else looking for food and then they, they worked their way back here. Um, what kind of leader for streams and outflows? Yeah, so just the 5X leader is fine. Outflow sinking tip. 5X regular, yep. Mickey fin and mother sizes. 
the trial, yeah, I'm late. If you're going to be trolling, you could definitely go up to a six or a four. Um, but eight to 12 is kind of in that range. I, I'm usually in the higher end of that. I'm using the eights and sixes is what I'm fishing. All right. What else about the how? Uh, we talked about already where we're going to find those. Let me talk about lakes a little bit. Um, so this picture actually is pretty, pretty, it's pretty insightful and it tells the story. You can see it's pointed to shore about a cast away. So in the bow of the boat, you're casting forward to shore and you strip the boat, you strip it back. Um, that's kind of the, the goal here. The water temperature tells you if you can fish on the surface. If it's eight degrees, 10 degrees, 12 degrees Celsius, great. You can fish on the surface, meaning a floating line, uh, five X liter. You could use a dry fly and try dropping dry flies and maybe twitch them and, and slowly bring them back, you know, make them make a little wake, skate them, totally fine. That's what that hornberg is for, is skating in that case, meaning a dry fly that's moving across the surface. Um, but here's the thing, because they're schoolish, because they hang out together, you gotta find where they are. So here's what I do. I show up at a small lake. I have a plan, a root plan that's gonna hopscotch through a couple little lakes. And I troll across that lake. I drag a Mickey fin. Maybe I put a big noisy muddler, uh, muddler bunny with a, a, and then four feet behind it, I'm gonna put a, a real a Mickey fin, a quiet one. Drag them around, right? Troll around in the canoe until you feel a tap, you feel you hit it, then you stop and you fish there. If you get a tap, there's probably 15 fish there in a school, if that's the right word, they're hanging out there. So you, you troll around, when you get a tap, you stop, you go back, you're gonna have your length of your line out behind you, right? So you go back to where the fly was and then you fish, right? That's, that's, the, way, that's the way it works. I mean, you can dry fly fish at that point. Once you know where they are, you can fish them a whole lot easier. The challenge on a lake is where the heck are they? That's why I stick to the smaller ponds. It's a lot easier to cover that pond and figure out where they are. Um, the other version, rather than just trolling around and hoping to get a tap, is to drift along the shore and cast about eight feet deep, cast to shore and bring it back. You travel along the shore and you could do this in a float tube, although float tubes are pretty slow. Canoes work a bit better to cover ground. Uh, and you can cast and strip back, cast and strip back. As soon as you get a hit, stop and fish there because there's going to be 15 fish hanging out in that spot. 200 meters away, there's going to be no fish, right? There's no sense leaving if you got a tap there already. Um, poppers in late spring, not often poppers. Um, that's more of a fall thing. Realistically, there's not a lot of frog action in the spring. It's too cold. Um, I've never, I've never had any luck on a popper in the spring. I also don't try it very often. I do try it in the fall and there's more going on. Suez River, yeah, Suez River is good. Um, log jam, grab bar, yep, all that stuff. That's all lake stuff, right? Any structure is what we're going to be looking for in this case. You got to find them though. They're not in the same place all the time. They move around. All right, lakes. Um, Here's my one minute on summer trolling. I don't go fishing in Algonquin Park in the summer because it is trolling. Um, and you basically are gonna use a sinking line and get it down 15 feet. That's where they are. Remember that idea, the surface is too hot, down low is no oxygen. They find the line in between. That's at about 15 feet deep and you can just drop your thermometer to find where 15 Celsius is, but it's usually around there. You put your full sinking line out right into the backing. The backing is gonna be getting wet and you troll around, right? So you've got to get your fly down and it's just going to drag down there. And I'd say two flies, a noisy fly and a quiet one. Um, something with a big head and then a Mickey fin behind it. Or heck, put a spoon on your sinking line, right? If, if that's palatable for you, just trolling, right? It's not fly fishing. In the summer, there is some cruising in the, in the dusk. So at that half hour before, before dark, which is when the bugs are nasty, um, that's when the bugs are terrible that's when the fish are cruising. So potentially you could cast right from your campground. Um, no, not a campground. If you're interior camping, you can cast from your, your, your campsite and potentially happen to catch a fish that's cruising by at dawn and dusk. You might see them rising by the same spot. They're cruising. So you have to get lucky and do an intercept with them. 
summer fishing's not very productive. Spin casting is a better option because it just sinks better. Um, but I, I have friends who, who take their fly gear on sinking lines and go and troll around because they like canoeing and uh, that works out. Okay, um, let's see, fishing from shore, not very often because the back cast is so terrible. The, if the lake is nice and has a little beach area, that's great. You can stand and wade, but many lakes drop off too deep with big chunky rocks. It's not really great shore fishing. Fishing from a canoe is better. I know fly fishing from a canoe gets a bad rap. And here's why it gets a bad rap. If you're trying to paddle your canoe, control your canoe and fly cast, that's not really possible. And, and that sucks. What needs to happen in a canoe is you have somebody in the back driving and you're in the front casting and you take turns. That's the way that goes. You need a dedicated driver. That's why some people hire me as a guide is to paddle them around. And I'm totally fine with that. Um, fishing from a canoe is totally viable. Think about the Miramichi salmon fishing and the Gaspé salmon fishing out of canoes. There's a hundred year history of doing that. In Maine, there's a very rich history of fly fishing from canoes. And in Algonquin Park, we've got, we have, we have 80 years of history of fishing in that park that were all fly fishing from a canoe before a spin casting ever came along. So um, don't discount fishing from a canoe, especially that canoes get you across the lake safely and quickly. You can portage them, you can make it all work. Having an anchor helps in a canoe. Remember, you're gonna find fish and then you're gonna stop and fish them. Now, portaging a 10 pound anchor is not fun. Don't do it. Carry a big canvas bag. You get to the lake, you fill it up with rocks, tie your bow line to it, that's your anchor. When you're done ready to portage, you dump the rocks out, roll up the canvas bag and carry it away, right? So, so that's your anchor system. You can float to the smaller ponds. Don't bother with the big lakes because you just, I don't even mean, I don't even mean that. Don't bother the medium lakes. There's just too much water to cover and your float tube's too slow. I'd suggest carry a kayak paddle on a leash. Paddle yourself around in your float tube. You might. You, you might feel uncool doing that, but nobody's gonna see you. Um, it's not busy, right? You might see canoers out there, but it's not that busy. Um, uh, and that's a way to use a float tube. It's just, you don't cover as much ground in a float tube. Lastly, motor shuttles. The big lakes, you can hire a boat to get you across them in a, in, and pay, right? So there's motor shuttles to get you across Opiongo Lake. You can put your canoe on the roof, you can cover a 20 kilometers of big lake and they dump you off at a portage trail and away you go. Uh, you just cut out a day's worth of paddling and now you're in the backcountry. And you can get them to pick you up at the end of the day, right? So same thing. Um, Algonquin Outfitters is the, the service provider on most of those big lakes for motor shuttles. All the big lakes have them. Um, Grand Lake, Cedar Lake, Opiongo Lake and Canoe Lake all have motor shuttles. Okay, so a couple last thoughts here. This is adventure fishing. It is not park and play fishing. So I'm gonna show you a map here in a second. Like I said, there's only one place to park and fish. Otherwise, you've gotta get away from the beaten track. People have been going to Algonquin Park for 130 years. If the fishing was easy, those fish were caught a long time ago. So you've gotta get where the fishing is hard. You do need a permit, both for a day, day use and for um, overnight use. Um, so if you have to buy a vehicle permit for a day or overnight campsite, you have to make a reservation. Just so you know, that's all done online through Ontario Parks. You need to spend a bit of time planning. You need to look at maps. I'm gonna talk about maps in a second here. You will see on Google Earth and on maps, there are roads all through Algonquin Park and they are all closed to the public. They're logging roads and you're trespassing if you're driving on them and you'll get a trespassing ticket. So don't mess with that. Um, there's access roads, fine, open. But then when it says there's a gate, it's usually an open gate because there's logging trucks going through um, and it says river closed from here on out, that's the deal, the river's closed. Um, water taxi is the word, right? Nicole had said that's, that's the, the shuttle across the big lakes. Um, bugs, 
you need to know that the bugs can be atrocious. Uh, here's the story. When the bugs are biting, the brook trout are biting. That's one of the rules of thumb. The bugs are at their, they usually come out after the first two days of 20 degrees Celsius, which is usually around the May long weekend, is when the bugs pop. So you can, and they come out one day. One day there's no bugs. The next day there's a lot of bugs. Uh, they all hatch. So it's quite fascinating to see a black fly hatch, right? Millions of black flies coming off the water, um, which brook trout eat, obviously, but the flies are pretty micro. Um, bugs. So what do you do about bugs? Obviously, DEET bug spray works, but it's bad for the fish and it's bad for your fishing gear. Um, you need to be really careful and keep it off your hands is what that comes down to. So you wear gloves, um, wear a hat, wear a buff. You can put bug spray on all that stuff on your head or have somebody, I use a, I provide a pump bug spray. So not the stuff you wipe on your hands, like you don't put it in your hands and wipe it on. You actually just pump it onto your hat or pump it onto your, your, your um, buff around your neck to keep the bugs off it. And then your hands don't get covered in this stuff. Um, yeah, bad for the bugs, sorry, bad for the water. Bad for the bugs too, right? Kills them, <laughs> that's why it works. Um, but bad for the water, bad for the fish, and bad for your plastic mono fishing lines. Not a good idea. But regardless, bugs are bad. There's bug shirts, which is like a pullover with a mask, which really work, can't see very well. And there's also those um, butane, there's like little butane um, packs, they look like GPS machine, but basically they put out a little butane gas that, that keeps bugs away. They really work. Thermocell, that's the word. Thanks, Drift Outfitters. Those little thermocell, um, packs that you can just basically hook on your, your net tab on the back of your, your PFD or on the back of your, your net or the on back of your, your vest. Um, let's see, what else? Bring a net. I'm not sure your experience catching brook trout, but man, they are slippery and squirmy. And if you got anything more than a six inch fish, you're not going to be able to land it without breaking your leader. Um, so, so a net's a good idea, whether it's a standard net or a breakdown that you can, can some fold up and you can put them in your backpack for portaging. Obviously, this is adventure fishing, so you need to worry about water and food and having a raincoat and all that other stuff. Um, even if you're planning only to go for a day, you get two portages in, you've got at least an hour or two to get home and, and you want to be prepared. Um, I want to make a couple last notes about safety. The big lakes can kill you, and you need to be careful about Opiongo Lake, uh, Grand Lake, Cedar Lake. On a windy day, those places are not to be messed around with. Uh, and that's when, a, when a, a, a water taxi really works. The big motorboats can plow through the waves, but in a canoe, you have to be prepared to just wait and let the weather die at dusk, which is usually what happens. Um, don't mess around with the wind on big lakes. We're gonna be there in May and it's cold, cold water. And if you flip out of your canoe on a big lake in cold water, um, that's, that's a dangerous situation. For that reason, wear a life jacket, right? In a canoe, wear your life jacket. Hey, it's up to you what you wanna do when you're waiting. But even when you're waiting, it's cold, fast water. And to take a swim, man, that's not fun in May, right? Think about this, the weather's gonna be 15 degrees and the water's gonna be eight degrees. That's the recipe for, um, for hypothermia. So anyways, play safe. The other part of that story is cell phone coverage only exists on Highway 60. As soon as you leave the highway, there's no cell phone coverage. So you might choose to have a satellite communicator like the inReach or a spot device. If that's news to you, go to Canadian Tire and check them out. I don't know, Drift, you carry satellite communicators, that's a bit outside the realm of fly fishing, isn't it? But um, cell phone coverage is pretty limited in the park just to carry them. Uh, thanks, Demisha. Yes, you can rent a satellite uh, communicator from any of the canoe tripping outfitters like Algonquin Portage Store. Okay, my last piece of advice here is the one portage rule. For every portage you add, the fishing doubles. Every portage you add, the quality of fishing doubles. So if you're gonna park your car and slide into a pond, slide into a lake, okay, you can fish there. Probably not great. Portage away, one portage, the fish will be twice as good. Portage one more pond or one more lake, the fish will be twice as good as that. 
right? It's really that clear as the farther you get from your car, the better the fishing is going to be. You could do that in a day trip, or you could do that as a multi-day canoe camping trip. You choose, right? How ambitious you want to be and how much of an adventure you're up for. Last point is about, um, oh, I have a couple more questions. From Ottawa, do you concentrate on the east side of the park? Um, I do all sorts of trips, right? So we do Highway 60 stuff, which is least productive, but honestly, people like to do Highway 60 because they know that. Um, so I do trips along Highway 60, but the better fishing is on the east side of the park and on the north side of the park. That's, that's just the reality because there's fewer people there and you can get across the lakes. Um, uh, Dave Martin asked a question, do brook trout hang out in the weedier sections of the creeks and rivers? In May, there are no weeds. They all die in the winter. So the rivers are perfectly clean. The lakes are perfectly clean. Uh, it's not until the warmth comes on in June that all of the growth starts to happen. And that's when the lily pads and the weeds start to come out. So if you're fishing in June and there are, is, is some, some, some plant life, sure, cast against it because it's obvious good coverage and it's where the bugs are hatching. So again, so fish will be hanging out around those things. Um, but in May, you typically don't see though, you don't typically see anything growing yet. It's just too cold and uh, it's not there yet. Right? It's not that time of year. Okay, maps. Um, you had seen, I'm going to stop sharing here and put up another screen. So here's the problem. There is a great map that you can no longer buy. So you can, so, so here's what you can, you can, um, I'm going to show you this great map that you can't get anymore. So it's called the AlgonquinParkMap.com. The company is called Jeff's Map. That's not me, but there's a company called Jeff's Map that puts out this fantastic map that's got fish species and it's got trails and it's got all sorts of good stuff, right? And you can plan your trip off this. They have a website that does not seem to be operating. I emailed them two weeks ago in anticipation of talking to you tonight, and they've not gotten back to me. So I don't know what the deal is on these maps, but it's called the Algonquin Park Map, and the company's called Jeff's Map. It's excellent because it's got tons of fish stuff on it. It's got all of the distances and portages, as you can see on here, right? Um, I don't know what's up with that. Uh, I wish upon you that you can buy this, but you can't buy this map right now. Hopefully the company will get their act together and start to sell them again. So if anybody has any news about that, um, then, then, then you might be able to do that, right? Um, let's see, there is a, a um, oh, some people do know the story. Um, Jeff's map, Jeff left Jeff's map, right? Okay, great, so they split up. So. Um, they charged me for maps and never sent them. All right, okay, so don't go and buy those maps, regardless of the good map. What you can also do is you can find online is the um, canoe routes map for Algonquin Park. It's fine, it's got all of the um, lakes, it's got all the portages, it's got all the camps. You're going to need to do a bit of Google Earthing, but you don't get the fish species attached to them. But I've got some news for you there. I'm gonna flip back to my slides here. Um, there is some park resources available. So this book on the top left, Fishing in Algonquin Park, you're not going to learn a lot in that book, but there is an index with all of the lakes and what species they contain. Remember 260 brook trout lakes? You need to mark those on your map, and that's the streams you're going to fish are the ones connecting those lakes together, right? So that's available from Friends of Algonquin Park. It's like a $9 book, well worth your time. There's other ones like The Fishes of Algonquin Park. That's a $3 book, which explains the habitat, totally worth your money, as, as well as the, uh, the Raven Fish and Lakes book, which explains the habitat in Algonquin Park, totally worthwhile. So those are very inexpensive, and you can buy all those online. Friends of Algonquin Park Bookstore is where you find those books, and it's just mail order them and they're very inexpensive and they do a great job. Um, on the right side, the incomplete angler, little historical tidbit here, the, the, in, the incomplete angler was published in 1943 and was a bestseller in Canada and won the Governor General's Award that year for literature. 
it's a great book. It's available for free online if you go digging, but it tells a story of a, of a fishing adventure in 1943. Totally, totally shapes the history of what, what Algonquin Park is all about and totally worth reading. Uh, you'll enjoy it. Uh, it talks about lots of the classic flies that they're fishing at the time. So Bree asks the question, where do you find the list of the brook trout lakes? In that book called Fishing in Algonquin Park, the index in the back has the list of every lake and the species that is in those, whether it's lake trout, bass, etc. So that's where you find that. Um, Tim said that the Ontario Backcountry Camping Group on Facebook has PDFs of all of Jeff's maps. That sounds great and illegal. So you choose what you want to do with that. <laughs> <laughs> um, because obviously the map belongs to somebody and uh, passing it around for free is not within copyright. Um, Jeff's maps are available to download in their web page. Okay, awesome. So anyways, you got your homework cut out for you. We know what you're looking for. A place called Jeff's map, algonquinparkmap.com. That's the best map. And if you just need to figure out a way to get a hold of one of those, that's where you can plan your trip from. All right. Uh, great, thanks, David. David offered another uh, another um, historic book about uh, about canoeing, which is great. So I am totally happy to uh, to entertain any more questions, um, tactics, places to go, whatever that looks like. Oh, I was going to show you one thing, wasn't I? Where's the one place you can drive and fish? Um, I'm going to show you the one place you can drive and fish. Let me go back to my map. It's on Highway 60 west side of the park, inside the gate. It's the Ox Tongue Dam pullout. So let me show, it's at kilometer eight. So it is right here. So there's the west gate. So from Huntsville, you would come in the park, travel another eight kilometers to this picnic area, and it's the Ox Tongue Lake Dam, right? So, so also called Tea Lake Dam. So there's a dam there, and there's a pool below the dam regulations in the park so you can't fish within 100 meters of a dam but the bottom of the pool is outside the boundary you're allowed to fish the bottom of the pool you can't fish the top of the pool you do what you want with that fact um, but that's one place you can go and park and catch brook trout they're going to be two-year-olds right they're going to be the eight inch fish good fun i i, I enjoy that uh, i take beginners there sometimes um, but that's a place you can park and fish Otherwise, if you're a walker, you're not prepared to canoe, you're going to have to go examining trails like the Whiskey Rapids Trail. It follows along the river, and you're going to have to go exploring the Whiskey Rapids Trail to find spots to go fishing along in there. In May, that's doable as long as the waters come down and you're not dealing with the flood, as well as the famous backpacking trails that are in the park. You can like the uh, like the um, Uplands Backpacking Trail, the purple line here, it visits many different streets tube with you, or you could just hike in with your waders and, and see what you can do. My guess, my, my suggestion is this, is really study the maps, find an area to go fishing, and then spend a couple different trips to kind of experiment. It's not, your first trip's not going to be super successful. Your first trip's going to have to just be to figure out the place and, and, get a sense for how the place works. Um, if I'm gonna give you an option, it's get to the middle of the park. You know, if plan a canoe trip with your friends in May, let's say late May, yes, it's buggy, but it's warmer. Uh, the fish will be good and get into the middle of the park and fish the outflows, fish the streams between the lakes, um, put all that stuff together. That's, that's the way to make that work. All right, uh, Dan asks where the eight pounders lurk. Yeah, they're in the big lakes. Good, good luck finding them. Um, what about stocked lakes? Yeah, I don't spend much time on stocked lakes, Bree. Um, I prefer to go where the where the streams are, right? So that that's really what my choice and what I what I take your clients into is to find the streams. I spend a lot less time on the lakes themselves. Um, the good thing about the stocked lakes, especially Splake, is they're open later. Brook trout closes uh, September 29th. Splake closes, it's like October 30th or something. So you can potentially get a little more fishing out of that. Let me see what else I have for questions I might have missed. Um, all right. 
Okay, okay, I think I got all the questions. All right, what else? A couple more new ones come in here. Any more questions, folks? Uh, trolling with a fly rod? Trolling with a fly rod, good question. Full sinking line, right? A full sinking line, um, and you're going to put on a short leader. So let's say a three foot leader, three X, four X, something like that. I would say a noisy fly with a big head, right? Um, and then you could put a tailor on behind that and put in a Mickey fin. And then you're going to, if you're in the bow or in the stern, you're gonna put the, the rod in your lap, kind of in your knees, so you can hold on to it and you put your full sinking line out, you paddle your canoe and you just drag your whole line out and you're gonna cruise around really slow and you're gonna wait for a tap, right? You're gonna wait for a tap and you're probably gonna miss the first tap because you're paddling and you're not holding your rod, but you stop right away, reel in your line and you go back and fish where that tap was, right? That's how trolling works. You don't just mindlessly paddle around and wait for something to grab on. Um, you're using it to figure out where the fish are because where there's one tap, there's 15 fish. So you go back and fish there. That's the, that's the, the trolling setup. Um, favorite lakes in the middle of the park? So, so the middle of the park is, is a beautiful spot. So I would say anything in this, what we're looking at right here, Trout Lake, Misty Lake, um, the Upper Petawawa River, the Tim River, the Nipissing River, this whole region in the kind of central west part of the park is the headwaters of all these rivers. And there's long streams with nice ponds, they're not too big. That's where, that's where you go fishing, right? That's a good spot to go. Um, South River, I don't go over that far very often, so I can't tell you much about South River. I haven't been there in like 15 years. Um, thanks for all the feedback, folks. Great, thank you. Um, Michelle, like my, the, uh, oh no, Molly made a comment about the life jacket. I'm a big fan of life jackets, for sure. Um, what else, questions? Got all that, got all that. Anything else? Trolling about 30 feet from shore? Yeah, good. Yeah, that's a great suggestion. Yeah, troll about 30 feet from shore. And you basically do a long, slow lap around the shoreline. Yep. Um, do you get an occasional laker when you're chasing brookies? That's a great question, Cesar. Um, in, the, in early May, you have equal chance of catching a lake trout as you do a brook trout. But lake trout go deep pretty early, right? As soon as it starts to warm up, they leave the surface and they go down. They eat minnows. Right, and they, they start to go down, they go looking for bigger fish, right? They're, they're a more aggressive um, predator and they need to they eat bigger food. So they go down, let's say probably by third week of May, the chance of catching a lake trout on your fly rod is pretty low. You can troll for lake trout. How's this for getting complicated? Um, you can put two sinking lines on your reel. So you need a big reel, get like a nine weight reel, put two five weight or six weight sinking lines together and you're going to put all that out and you're going to do the same trolling. It can be a Mickey fin, it could be a dace, it could be a spoon, whatever. Um, but you've got to go way down, right? So brook trout are at about 15 feet, lake trout are at about 30 feet. So, so that's one of the old tricks from the old days is you basically run two fly lines, two sinking lines together. But uh, man, that's complicated and that's a lot of reeling whenever you catch a fish. Um, I don't bother lake trout. They're actually pretty boring to catch. They don't fight. They, they, they brook trout fight like crazy. Um, lake trout, don't do that. Lake trout. Um, yeah, Phil, ice out is only four months away. Yahoo. Looking for any more uh, points here I might have missed. Uh, good, so the map story, yep. Yeah. All right. All right. What do you think, gentlemen? We call it a day. That was yeah, terrific. That was, um, that was fantastic. That was amazing. Uh, I am fully confident with that information that I could go to a Gonquin Park and have a successful trip and set it up so it's scout and then go back and fish harder. But wow, that was that was absolute insider info. That was spectacular. All right. All right. Great. I had some folks and just saw a question there. I'm totally booking for May, right? I've, I've, got, uh, I've got a bunch of dates already on the calendar. So AlgonquinFlyFishing.com. I've got a calendar of open dates or just contact me through that. And I'm happy to work with you to set up a time. That'd be awesome to turn some trips out of this. That'd be great. 
yeah, please check out his uh, website yeah. uh, for all yeah. information and his rates and all that as well. And to get out there with him. Uh, you're looking at the person who has, has the know-how and will get you on the fish and show you the area. So it's just spectacular. Yep. Great. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for hanging in there for such a great evening. Happy to do it.